Hey guys, Million Dollar Batchmaker here, making a slurry of seaweed for my next project. But this episode is not about seaweed at all. It's about how to keep seaweed and similar items fresh and microbe free. Today is all about preservatives. I'll tell you everything I know. A lot of you might not know this, but seaweed and algae are known as superfood for fungi, bacteria, and mold. So, wait a second. How can I use seaweed in a product when it promotes microbe growth? Well, as you might guess from the video's title, we will use preservatives. In fact, for each cosmetic and personal care product we make, we should be asking this fundamental question, should I use a preservative? Preservatives are honestly part of your insurance policy. When making cosmetics, preservatives are simply a way of covering your ass when you release products into the marketplace. It's called CYA and it's a vital part of any business. Here are some general rules to follow when deciding whether to use them. 1. If your product contains a high amount of water, as most cosmetic products do, you should use a preservative. Why? Because, like pretty much all life on Earth, microbes rely on water for a brief metabolism. 2. Products that do not contain water should be approached on a case-by-case -case basis. For instance, while most oil blends, salts and vinegar scrubs do not require a preservative due to not having water, these items might be used in places where water is plentiful like a shower. So putting a preservative in them is probably a smart idea. 3. The number of products that can go without preservatives is narrow. We're talking about waterless, anhydrous body bombs or oils that will most likely never see the inside of a shower. Also, products with pH ranges in the extreme high or low ranges can sometimes go with no or very low amounts of preservative. However, in each of these cases, choosing not to use a preservative comes with risk as custom customers can always unintentionally contaminate a product. For instance, if your product is in a jar, more than likely your customer is putting their contaminated hand repeatedly into the product and introducing microbes. So let's keep this in mind. Now, let's go to our next topic of conversation. I'm going to introduce you to five broad categories of preservatives that are used extensively in foods and cosmetics. The first category is parabens. <coughs> Yes, yes, the evil, evil parabens. They are clearly the worst things to have in any food or cosmetic item. And yet, these are some of the most widely used preservatives in the marketplace. And for good reason. They are effective and relatively cheap. In a typical cosmetic formula, parabens such as methyl and propylparaben only have to be added to a formulation at anywhere between 0.01% and 0.3%. And when parabens are used in combination with one another, they can offer a very broad protection against yeast, mold, fungi, and numerous gram-positive bacteria. In fact, from talking to other manufacturers, I know there are numerous pharmaceutical products that use parabens because there are no suitable substitutes. Now, there are numerous concerns that parabens are cancerous and that they may enhance or manipulate estrogenic activity in the body. However, I have to be truthful and state that any potential harmful effect of paraben use has not been firmly proven or established. If you want more information on studies that have been done on parabens, please check out the related links in the description box below. Meanwhile, let's move on to the next category. Formaldehyde and formaldehyde releasing preservatives. Formaldehyde is a naturally occurring chemical that has been used extensively in manufacturing processes for over the past 100 years or so. And as a preservative, formaldehyde has a long-standing reputation for effectiveness. 
Think about how long funeral homes have been using embalming fluid, which is usually between 5 and 50% formaldehyde, to preserve dead bodies. Well, formaldehyde releasing preservatives work along the same logic. These preservatives release small amounts of formaldehyde into your cosmetic formula. Per the manufacturer's dosing instructions, the amount of formaldehyde released into your product is usually low enough to be safe to humans, but still high enough to inhibit bacterial and fungal growth. All that being said, formaldehyde has long been known to be hazardous to human health in large amounts. Exposure has been shown to result in anything from mild symptoms such as skin irritation to dermatitis to an increased incidence of leukemia and other types of cancer. It has not definitively been proven, however, that the low levels of formaldehyde that result from using this class of preservative has any long-term health effects. Here on the shelf I have DMDM Hydantoin, a very common formaldehyde releasing preservative. Now. Let's go on to the next exciting category. Behind this door, I have one of the most controversial preservative groups ever created. Isothiazolinones. During the 90s and throughout the first decade of the 21st century, Kathan CG and products like it saw explosive usage in the cosmetics industry. These are isothiazolinones, a class of preservative that is synthetic but broad spectrum and very effective across a wide pH range, and have been thus far shown to be non-carcinogenic. However, these preservatives have their own problems. First of all, there are well-known cytotoxins and have been linked to various types of skin irritation. Furthermore, certain products in this preservative class have been implicated as being very toxic to the environment, specifically to aquatic life. For this reason, regulatory bodies worldwide have been moving to limit its use in cosmetic products, yet it's still widely used in rinse-off products today. And now we turn to a preservative that is found in green tea and used in a ton of products, including perfumes. I'm talking about phenoxyethanol. Phenoxyethanol has been shown to be effective against both gram-positive bacteria, gram-negative bacteria, and yeast. In addition, it is considered to be very stable preservative. What I mean by that is that it can be added to cosmetic products at varying pH ranges. It can also be added at varying temperature ranges. For example, the seaweed that I showed you at the beginning of this video has phenoxyethanol that I added at 75 degrees Celsius. Also note that phenoxyethanol has somewhat of a clean reputation so far. And what I mean by clean is that many regulatory bodies worldwide allow its use up to 1%. Even widely known natural wellness brands like the Honest Company allow for the use of phenoxyethanol in their products. That's not to say that phenoxyethanol is perfect. Use of this preservative has been proven to irritate the skin of some people when used above the 1% level, and when used by itself, Phenoxyethanol is generally not considered broad spectrum. Instead, it is often mixed with other preservatives to kill the broadest range of microbes possible. Just as a reference, here is what phenoxyethanol usually looks like. And this is phenoxyethanol mixed with another preservative called ethylhexylglycerin. And yet, the one thing that throws the most doubt on phenoxyethanol's future usage is the fact that its use has been rejected by some of the highest organic certification standards in the world, like EcoCert. And now we turn to our final general preservative category, organic acids. 
sometimes referred to as fruit acids. One example of this preservative is potassium sorbate. It is a salt of sorbic acid that has very low toxicity and has been used in many food manufacturing processes for decades. And this is how the granular form of this chemical looks like. Other chemicals in this preservative class include, but are not limited to, sodium benzoate, anisic acid, and levulinic acid. Now, this preservative group is probably the most varied, and it offers a number of benefits over the preservative groups we mentioned earlier. First, many of these preservatives have a long proven history of effectiveness in both foods and cosmetic products. Second, they occur naturally and can be found in numerous plants and fruits. Although, in reality, many of these preservatives are still produced using industrial or synthetic processes and not extracted from organic matter directly. And lastly, these organic acids can be combined with each other to achieve something close to broad spectrum coverage against mold, yeast, and bacteria. On the flip side, there are some drawbacks. The biggest one of all being that you typically need higher use levels when preserving with organic acids. That is, you are using a higher percentage of these preservatives compared to other types. Moreover, organic acids are not known to be particularly stable in final products. You may have to be more aware of pH range and temperature when adding these preservatives to your final product. So what have we learned so far? We've learned that there are a wider range of preservative choices when it comes to cosmetics. Preservatives can differ widely in their efficacy against bacteria, mold, and fungus depending on a variety of factors. And we also learned that before using any preservative in your products, consult the manufacturer's paperwork in regards to how it's applied to your product and under what conditions. This is important. As you have just seen, many preservatives are sensitive to pH and heat, and most importantly, they are only effective at certain use levels. Lastly, although I only mentioned five broad categories of preservatives here, there are technically more. For example, alcohol and quats are probably two notable categories that we did not cover but because these categories of chemicals typically have other, much broader uses, we did not include them in this video. Okay, so now I want to dispel what is probably the most common myth regarding the preservation of cosmetics and personal care items. The myth is the following. I can preserve my products with essential oils alone. No other preservatives needed. Truth is, you can't, and you probably shouldn't. For instance, here we have olive oil. Not extra virgin olive oil, just very basic olive oil pomace. Despite everything you may read on the internet, this is not an effective preservative by itself for cosmetics. It has some antimicrobial properties due to its chemical composition, but even with these properties, olive oil is not good enough to preserve water-based cosmetics such as lotions. Here we have grapefruit oil. Again, it has antimicrobial properties, but is not good to use. Not only is it expensive, but the amount you would have to use for preservation is so high, it's simply out of the question. Same goes for lavender oil, olive oil, rosemary oil, peppermint oil, tea tree oil, and garlic oil. Yes, there is something called garlic oil, and it's bad, real bad. I wouldn't even let my worst enemy smell this. So to sum things up, oils and essential oils are terrible choices for use as your main preservative especially when we're talking about water-based preservatives. 
While many of them do have strong antimicrobial properties, tea tree for example, to take advantage of them, you would have to use so much that it might make your products really expensive or affect some key functionality of your final product. Now, for our last topic of conversation, I wanted to introduce lab testing. And honestly, this topic deserves a whole video by itself. But I at least wanted to introduce how lab tests function in the cosmetic supply chain. Lab tests to determine the efficacy of preservatives on cosmetic products can range from $40 to many hundreds of dollars. It really depends on the kind of test you're doing and how long the test lasts. The two main testing methods used in the U.S. are USP and CTFA. And collectively, this kind of testing is called challenge testing. Usually, you would submit a 1 to 2 ounce sample like this to an analytical lab and they test the sample against various microorganisms to see if there is growth. Alright guys, I'm sure you have a lot of questions. Please feel free to reach out to me in the comments section. And with that, this has been Billion Dollar Batchmaker. See you next time.